like we get to sing. Amen. Amen. And I'm just very excited to hear a message from Pastor Metz tonight as he preaches to us on prayer. I've been praying that the Lord would get a hold of his heart so that he might get a hold of my heart. And hopefully you've been praying for that as well. I encourage you to keep praying as he comes tonight and then as he comes again tomorrow night. You know, how can you expect a blessing from the Lord, from a man of God, if you don't first pray that the Lord will touch that man of God's heart that you might have it? And we need to remember, our prayer life is very important. Nothing is going to be accomplished unless it begins with prayer, which is going to be for eternity. Our lives aren't going to change unless we go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to change them and are willing to listen to His response and the things we need to change. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Pastor Metz, and I'm ready to hear him preach, aren't you? Amen. Amen. I've got to turn this thing on, right? I've got to find my side pack here. Turn that one off. Turn this one off. So I got it. He promised me it's not too loud. <laughs> <laughs> you got to turn the full blast in. <laughs>
And even our folks, I didn't know anybody was coming from our church. Brother Boyce asked me last night if it'd be all right if he come, and I said, well, I think it'd be all right. I don't think they would not let you in. And, and then today, Brother Romney came by, and he asked, and he said, I'd sure like to go to that. And I said, well, come on down. And I said, I think they'll let you, they'll have an extra seat for you. And so they came. I, I don't quite understand that, why that they hear me for the last 27 years, why they want to come over here and hear me again. But I think some people have fallen in love not necessarily with the pastor, but they fall in love with the Word of God. Amen. And the Word of God is precious. And the Word of God must always remain precious, and I think prayer will help it to remain so. We're going to be in the first chapter of Nehemiah. Uh, tonight we'll be reading uh, verses 1 through 11 there probably. And while you're turning there, I'm going to turn back to James in chapter 5. And in James chapter 5, in verse number 16, there's another scripture verse that I want to bring to you, and we'll refer to it many times tonight. And it says in James chapter 5, verse number 16, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, permanent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now I realize that we're talking about uh, praying for the sick, but I'll tell you what, there's more ways of being sick than just have a tummy ache. They're sick of spirit, and sick of heart, and sick of soul. And I believe today that it's all taken care of in one. Praying and seeking God and the will of God in your personal lives. Have you ever read over there in the book of Second Corinthians, uh, First Corinthians? I think it is. I'll have to look now. You, I, I piqued my own interest. I have to go back and see what I'm talking about. Chapter number eleven, in whichever it is, Second Corinthians or First Corinthians, and uh, it is Second Corinthians. Well, maybe it wasn't either. Look one more time. I, this wasn't in the message, and so that's why this is stumbling here. But uh, this this happens quite a lot to me because I just kind of preach as as the Lord gives me utterance here. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter number 11, and it's talking about the Lord's Supper, and it comes down to uh, verse number 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Have you ever considered what the Lord's body is? Is it not the church? And so many times we're sick tonight because of a spiritual thing that's going on in our lives. And so we need to go to the Lord in prayer, and by confession of our sin and making our lives right with Him, we can be made well. I want you to notice back in James 5, in verse 16, it says, The effectual, permanent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now that's how you pray. It must be an effectual prayer, a permanent prayer, and must come from a righteous man, and I believe God will hear that prayer. Let's bow our heads in prayer as we even begin to preach tonight. Heavenly Father, we'd ask that you would teach us your word, that, Lord, you just draw us close to the throne of grace, that, Lord, it should help us to see over the portals of heaven and see your work there around the throne. Father, I pray that we might see the prayers, we might hear the prayers, or we might see your thoughts concerning prayer, and that, Lord, that our hearts would rejoice because of it. Father, I pray that you draw us close to you tonight. Lord, help us to understand the message. Lord, help us to be able to see our need and let Jesus be with the center of our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's keep that in mind now. The permanent prayer, the, the effectual, permanent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The prayer is simply communicating with God. I'm not going to tell you anything tonight you haven't already heard, but maybe I'll tell it to you in an order you haven't thought of it. Prayer is simply communicating with God. Now, some of you mothers know what it is to communicate and not to communicate. Some of you have told your children to take out the trash. It did not get done. Did you communicate? No. You said the words, but they had no effect upon the other party. Nothing came back. Communicating is back and forth, a response from the other one. And prayer is asking and receiving them. It is communicating with the God Almighty, the God of the heaven and the earth, the God who created mankind, the God who sits there and waits patiently for you and I to address Him. We find genuine communication results in a visible response. If we truly communicate with God in prayer tonight, we're going to see some visible response. My friend, God will not snub you. He'll not. He loves you too much. He gave His Son upon Calvary's cross for you. He's not going to snub you. And so when you truly communicate with Him, but my friend, He wants some honest communication. He wants some real communication. We find today that most public prayers are ineffective simply because in reality they are intended for man's ears and not God. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't have public prayers. That doesn't mean you shouldn't open the service with prayer. But it does mean those of us that lead in prayer 
in the service, we need to make sure that we're talking to God. Amen. And you just happen to be around. When I pray publicly, you just happen to be around. And you bow your head in reverence and respect to the Lord all God, God Almighty. And even you can breathe the same words that I breathe if it's so desire. And then we call that leading in prayer. But we're talking, we're communicating with God. My prayers, said a fellow, are the one grace which my foe cannot refuse. I can get at him through the God of heaven, said a fond mother, in speaking of her wayward, wandering boy. Yes, prayer is the greatest of the privileges that God has given to the children of men. It is one of the most mighty forces on the face of this earth which the soul of man can have to do. Prayer is, is talking as Adam and Eve did with God in the Garden of Eden. Oh, we can do it right here. That's talking with him. Through prayer, Elijah shut up the reign of heaven for three and a half years. In the book of James, chapter 5, verse 17, it states that. And Peter was delivered from prison in answer to the prayer of the church in Acts chapter 12 and verse number 5. Even though the church was unaware that their prayer was having any effect. I believe that the church there in that city that day is much like our churches gathered here in Oregon. We pray, but we don't often really re expect answers. And so I wonder today, why should we pray if we don't expect God to answer? What is wrong with our prayer? What is wrong with talking to God? What is wrong with expecting God? Are we asking God to do something we know that is not His will? Are we asking God to do something that we know is against His will? Are we asking God to do something that will feed the lust of our flesh, or the pride of our life, or the lust of our eyes? Then certainly, why waste your breath in praying? Having been made unto God... According to the book of Revelation in chapter 5 and verse 10, having been made unto God a kingdom of priests, it certainly sounds right to me that our part would be uh, a heavenly calling to make intercession for others, to pray for other people. This church has people in your heart and in your mind that are not saved that you need to be praying for. And you need to be praying that effectual, that fervent prayer. And you need to be praying as a righteous man that God in heaven will hear and that God, you see, although God cannot make a man get saved, as he cannot, he will not. But he can remove all obstacles, and so that Satan would have no power over him, and that man can see for himself, like the prodigal son did in the hog pen, he can come to himself and make his own decisions, rather than let his friends make his decisions, or rather than let the influences of the outside world make his decisions. And my God can stop all those influences of the outside world and the friends, and he will do that, I believe, even as you and I pray for those unsaved ones. In these words of Nehemiah, we think we see all the characteristics of prevailing prayer. Uh, first off, as we look here, now there's a, there's a lot of words in here I can't pronounce. And I believe, I'll tell you what, I sat down today and I found me a Bible, and if you've got one, that's fortunate, that has all the little markings in to tell you how to pronounce these names. And, of course, I'm not using that Bible tonight, and so I have forgotten how they were marked. So I may have to call some of these fellows George. And, but you'll understand what I mean. I mean, no disrespect to the Word of God. But I don't know that guy anyway. God does. And it says, In the words of Nehemiah, the son of, that's George, and he came to pass in the month Shuslu, which is December, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Haniah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left in the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant are that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass that when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Folks, I don't know about you, and I, I can't get this out of my mind, so I'm going to tell you about it anyway. And I have no real scriptural basis for it, but when I heard Nehemiah uh, listening to the message coming from home, coming from Jerusalem, coming from the promised land, coming from the center of the world, where one day Jesus is going to rule uh, out of the, have his throne there in Jerusalem, I find that uh, I looked at that city as my church, the church that I pastor. And I got to thinking about sometimes are the gates broken down? in my church? Have the walls been broken down in our church? What's caused these things? Have the enemies been so strong in America today that the church has no power 
Her, her walls cannot stand. Her gates cannot hold up. And my friend, I believe the enemy is that strong if the church is not a praying church. If the church does not hold those up with prayer. But anyhow, never mind. You just put that in your hat and think about it for a while. But old uh, Nehemiah sat down and he wept. And he mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He wept, he mourned, and he fasted. There was, this was no formal prayer, was it? This was the outcome of a soul that was being stirred to its utmost depth. I mean, it was, forgive me, a gut-wrenching experience for him. Something that tore him up from the inside out as he thought of that great and that mighty city where the power of God had once shined out of, of every house, where the light of God had once flourished, where the blessings of God had once been poured out from heaven unto the earth. He thought of the great temple that Solomon had built. He thought of the great things that God had done. He thought of all the victories and the battles that God had won for his people. And then he had to remember the sin that had come into their lives and how that their sin had caused defeat. He had to remember how that their, all the good things were taken away from them as they left their God. In Psalms chapter 126 and verse number 6, They that go forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again, rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. My friends, yeah. tonight we need to look at the world as a world without Jesus Christ, and it ought to cause our hearts to be broken. And until we can come to a broken heart for lost souls, we're not going to see a lot of souls saved. If you're here tonight and you want to be a soul winner and you want to do something for Jesus on this side of heaven, you're going to have to concentrate on getting a broken heart for the souls of men and women. I believe Jesus left heaven with a broken heart. I believe Jesus went to the cross of Calvary with a broken heart. I believe Jesus arose from the dead with a broken heart. I believe Jesus spoke to the assembly there in Jerusalem for 40 days with a broken heart. I believe, my friend, when Jesus comes back in the clouds of glory, even reigning as he will, I believe he'll still have a broken heart for those that refused him as their Lord and their Savior. I believe Jesus is the one. It says he was acquainted with grief in the book of Isaiah in chapter 50, 53. Those who, drive nigh, those who draw nigh with the lip while the heart is afar off may themselves be satisfied with a prayer that is nothing but a solemn mockery in the sight of God. I, I want to read that to you again, all right? I'm just going to read that and then I'll talk about it a minute. Those who draw nigh with the lip, while the heart is afar off, may themselves be satisfied with a prayer which is nothing but a solemn mockery in the sight of God. Many of our prayers today are just a mockery of the power of God. They're a mockery of the word of God in which they were written. They're issued from lips that are unclean. They're issued from lips uh, whose, whose owners are in sin and babbling in sin in every single way that they possibly can. They're as unclean as they can possibly be. They're corrupt. They remind me of the man over there uh, that was the putrefying sore and, and <coughs> his uh, wound was not was not, not not being cleaned up and it was not being taken care of. And, and so it was, it was gangrene was setting in, my friend. Uh, today, many people play church in our churches. Many Christians. And it seems like that the longer we're in church, the more susceptible we are to becoming players at the house of God. We sit and we play the, the pew warmer. We play at ushering. We play at singing. We play at all these things, and especially when it comes to prayer. Because one of the first things that's going to leave you as you get cold and backslidden and indifferent will be prayer. You'll not have time to pray. You'll not have time. You'll even read your Bible longer than you will pray. But you're going to leave prayer. Today, the majority of Christians have never really learned to pray. They never come to God and sit there. I know this last week, uh, uh, the pastor where and I was speaking in this Bible conference wanted us to pray for 40 minutes every day. I'm not used to praying for 40 minutes, to be honest about it, but I like it. And I went down in the first two days, I just sat there. I said, Lord, I already told you everything I know. I didn't have 40 words or 40 minutes. I told everything I knew three times. And then I decided, well, this is not doing a whole lot of good. You know, prayer is not only speaking to God, but, but letting God speak to you. Yeah. And so I started taking the Bible. I started looking through the Psalms. Um, I, the other day I was in distress, and, and my heart, I, I couldn't get peace and everything. And so I, I got up, and I started reading in the book of Psalms, and I found that David had the same feelings that I did. And his heart was broken. It was... It was in distress, and, and he prayed a tremendous prayer. And I just got on my knees, and I said, Lord, here's a prayer. Here's what I'm talking about. Here's what I meant. Here's what I was trying to say. And the Word of God has a tremendous part in our prayer life. 
But we've got to have to open up the door and say, God, I want you to do something in my life. He said, I sat down and I wept and I mourned uh, in certain days and I fasted and I prayed before the God in heaven. As God loveth the cheerful giver, so doth he regard the wholehearted petitioner. I believe that. My friend, God said he loves uh, that cheerful giver. I believe he loves that wholehearted petitioner. It was of his command that he said, ask and you shall receive. It was his command that he said, seek and you shall find. Or knock and it shall be opened unto you. Over in the book of First uh, Chronicles, my tongue's getting around my eye teeth. I can't see where I'm going. But in the book of First Chronicles, if you'll turn there with me, it's somewhere in the Old Testament, folks. <coughs> Have you found it? I don't even hear your pages turning. Is my ears going bad too? I knew my throat was getting... <coughs> getting stiff, but I, I didn't know my ears were. Have you found First Chronicles, <coughs> chapter 7? You must have quiet pages in your Bible. I hadn't even found it yet. Somebody stole Chronicles out of my Bible. Same one. Now that's better. <clears throat> you know, I don't think you were turning before, were you? I like that. Have you, have you found First Chronicles, chapter 7? Yeah. Good. Now look at verse number 12. First Chronicles chapter 7. And that's not what I want. Is it? It must have been 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I marked this out. I, I, I wrote this in my notes. I said, no, that's not right. And I went back and I looked. And lo and behold, I changed it. I must have changed it wrong. You ever done that? You know what verse I'm looking for, don't you? When old Solomon built his temple. My, I tell you what, they've done a tremendous job building that temple. But it came down for dedication day. You know, the, the best works of men are nothing if God doesn't accept it. Amen. And on that dedication time, it came to verse number 12 of chapter 7, and it is 2 Chronicle. I have to change my notes back the second time now. It says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night, and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Isn't that marvelous? Amen. Here's the answer for America today. Here's the answer for President Clinton. If he would just look at the Word of God, he claims to be a Christian. Let's look at the Word of God and see what God has to say. Here's the answer for those of us in the pew today. Here's the answer for the preachers that stand behind the pulpits today. We need to do something about the, what the Word of God is saying to do. If my people, which are called by my name, number one, shall humble themselves. It's hard for preachers to humble themselves. It's hard for men in the congregation to humble themselves. It's hard for deacons to humble themselves. But let me tell you something, my friend. It was not hard for Jesus to humble himself. Amen. And he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Right. He's the eternal Amen. I am. But my friend, he was able to humble himself before men. He washed their feet. He walked with men upon the face of the earth. He grew weary and he grew tired. He accepted their insults, my friend. And when they had done all they could do to him, he laid down upon the cross. Humble himself, my friend. I think it was humbling because he could have called and legions of angels would have come to his rescue. The heavens would have just been filled with angels pouring out of heaven to save the Son of God. But my friend, he did not call a single one of them. He did not call upon his Father. My friend, instead, he laid on that cross and let him nail his hands. Let him nail his feet to that old rugged cross. Surely he humbled himself. And what man of you is here tonight that should not be a humble child of God? What man of you today? You see the Bible said on the book of James that if I humble myself, that God will lift me up. We get tired of waiting on God, don't we? And so we lift our own selves up. We get tired of waiting on God to reward us for our good Christian character. And so we lift our own selves up. And that's exactly why that God hasn't lifted us up before. Because he knew that that sour note was still in us. He knew that down in the depths of our heart, camouflaged back behind all the other things, there was that sin lying there, that sin of pride. But anyhow, he said, humble themselves. And he said they should pray. My friend, what is prayer if it's not seeking my face? Prayer is seeking the face of God. Seeking the face of God. You know, the Pentecostals, if you're a Pentecostal, I, mean, no, I don't mean anything against you necessarily, but they had a terminology when I was a kid. I always heard about the Pentecostals praying through. And I never knew what that was until so I became a Baptist. You know, Christians, sometimes it takes a long time for you and I to start praying. 
Because we've got to go through a lot of garbage. We've got to go through a lot of garbage in our life before we can get to the throne of grace. You see, God wants some clean vessels to call upon his name. He said the effectual, permanent prayer of a righteous man, wasn't it? A righteous man. Have you ever thought about your righteousness, friend? The Bible said that all my righteousness are as filthy rags. And that's when I compare them to Jesus. Have you ever thought about the scripture that says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Is it one of you, even since you've been saved, you've raised to a point of sanctification that you no longer sin? Then you're a liar. Because you're not going to do it on this earth. As long as you're in the flesh. You might cut it down, my friend, but as long as you're in the flesh. Maybe we don't go out and drink and chase wild women, my friend, but in our heart we may be. And that's going to influence our prayer. How many of you have ever fought with your wife? <laughs> Not one single person here. How many are liars here? <laughs> yeah. Did you know that hinders prayer? Even disagreements with your wives, and I guess that means also disagreements with your husband that that hinders our prayer life. Amen. Brother, you ever seen some of your folks come to church after they've had a little tip? And you can sure tell it, can't you? There's a dark cloud of Satan authority over their eyes. Well, I tell you, humble yourself, seek my face, turn from their wicked way. When God put down something here and he showed us something that was wicked, he said, we ought to turn away from it. But Lord, I love it. It's a part of me. I've always had it. Have you ever said that? I like it. I don't think I can do without it. Oh, I'll tell you what. You'll be able to do it without it if you replace it with the right thing. Amen. By the way, it's never good to take something out of your life and not put something back in that place. As a Christian, as you grow up in Christ, you're going to find some things that you don't want in your life. And so you're going to say, I want you to get out of my life. Don't leave it vacant. A vacant house gets moldy. That's an organ rendition of that saying. <laughs> A vacant house is not what we need to fill that up with something else that God has. I have found in my Christian life I never gave up anything for God. I have traded a lot of things in. Traded a lot of things in. I traded things in for my Lord because I found that what he had for me was better than what I had in mind for myself. And so he said, humble ourselves. He said, we ought to pray, seeking my face. He said, and then will I hear from heaven. Now, wait a minute, I left that one. I always like to leave that one out because I hate, I can admit it sometimes, but I don't want to turn from my wicked way. I don't want to turn from my wicked way. Because you see, for me to turn from my wicked way is oftentimes to make an apology for the outright pride that I have been practicing. To turn from my wicked way is to go and say somebody else was right instead of me. And I like to be right. I'm still not getting any amens. <laughs> Am I speaking above your head? Do you understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> All right. Let's get the message tonight. And he said, then I will hear from heaven. And will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The blessing doesn't come. God doesn't pay attention. God doesn't listen until he's heard that prayer, even from you and I, of getting right with God. Lord, change me and make me right with your will. And then he says, I will hear from heaven. And he said, then I will hear their land. And he goes on and on. But that's, that's the crux of it. That's not the whole message tonight, so we've got to hurry on. There's just some things here. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The fervent in prayer. I believe Nehemiah was one of those guys. He was fervent in his prayer. And he was praying. My friend, I want you to see his righteousness. It said in verse 5, and he said, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keep a covenant <laughs> mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that I may that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night. For the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess, underline that word, and confess the sins of the children of Israel. Not just his sins, but the sins of the whole nation, which we have, now he puts himself in it, which we have sinned against thee. Which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. Both I and my father's house have sinned. You know, sin is hard to get rid of. We moved here some time ago out into the country. And out into the country is wonderful, except there's an awful lot of mud in Oregon. And this mud was the slick kind. The ground would not be wet more than that deep. But it would be slick, so slick you couldn't stand up on it. 
you would fall flat on your face when you tried to step out there. I don't know how a vehicle was able to drive on it. They weren't very well. We got stuck more often than not. And I was thankful at that time that I had a four-wheel drive pickup so I could get out of my driveway and it sprinkled that day. But oh, I'll tell you what, that mud was something else. It was hard to get rid of. You'd go up on the porch, you'd stomp your feet, and you'd scrape your shoes, scrape your shoes. You'd step in the house, my wife said, take them off. <laughs> She wouldn't let it, even though they appeared to be clean, she said, take them off. And sometimes I just ignored her being the wonderful husband that I am. And I tracked red footprints. She could tell me down there's nobody got feet as big as mine. <laughs> In our house anyway. Across the carpet. Oh, I tell you what today, folks, that just proof that my feet weren't clean. And it's proof today as God looks down upon us that our hearts aren't clean. He said, confess. He said, I am my father's house have sin. It was because that Nehemiah knew God that he could pray. You see, knowledge is important when we pray. It's because that Nehemiah knew God that he could pray. Now, it's always important, and we've talked about this a lot in our Sunday school classes and in our preaching, that God needs to know you. We talk about Matthew in chapter 7, where those people cast out devils in the Lord's name, did many wonderful works in their name, and then Jesus came and he said, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Well, if you get saved, Jesus knows who you are. Amen. If you're sincere about that, he knows who you are. But let me ask you something. Do you know who God is? Do you know who God... I believe that God knows who you are better than you know who you are yourself. Right. God knows who you are. Uh, God knows what's in your heart. God knows what's in your mind. But do you know what's in God's heart? Do you know what's in God's mind? Do you know what God's going to do in any given uh, situation? He believed in God's greatness. He believed in God's terribleness. He believed in God's faithfulness and His mercifulness. And I think that's something we've got to believe in today. We've got to come to know God. He said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven. Look at verse 5. I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for him that love him and observe his commandments. He said, I, I know who you are. I know you're the great God. He said, I know you're the creator of the universe. When we go to the Lord in prayer, we're talking to the great I Am. <clears throat> it's important today to know who God is. Amen. It's important that you realize that you can't hide any sin in your life. My friend, you are an open book unto the Lord God Almighty, more open to Him than you are to your wife or to your husband. God knoweth what lieth in the hearts. Right? It's scary, isn't it, sometimes, when we realize what's, what worketh down in the depths of our souls and in our hearts. What things that we as Christians are covering up in our lives. What feelings, what lust, what, what evil desires. But God sees them every time that you go to Him in prayer because He sees you Amen. and who you are. We can fool our wives and we can fool our husbands and we can fool our preachers and we can fool the church, my friend, but we cannot fool God. And that's why a lot of prayer is just in vain because we have not known God enough to realize that He sees all of that. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter number 11, I hold your hand in Nehemiah, we're coming right back. But in Hebrews chapter number 11, and many of you have probably memorized it, well, let's try looking at it again. Chapter number 11, verse number 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that's no problem for you, but that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do we really know God? I believe that Moses knew God. Moses knew God. You know, I, I envy certain characters of the Bible. And Moses is one of them. Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. I want to see God. I want to see God in my spirit. I want to see God in my soul. I want to see God in my life. I want to be able to look around and say, Hi, Lord, and see him there. Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. And then in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, he said, He that cometh to God must believe that he is one, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's number two, and that's an answer to prayer. If we're going to have successful prayer, we must believe that our God can do whatever he said he could do. We must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently come to him. My friend, is it worthwhile to have clean lives? Is it worthwhile to have fresh hearts and fresh souls? Is it, clean? is it worthwhile to let God open your heart and your soul and your life and say, Lord, have your will in my life? To know God in such fashion is to ask much and expect much. They that do know their God shall do strong exploits. I wondered, I've wondered at some of the things that I've heard about 
when it comes to prayer. I've wondered how Moses would walk along there and the children of Israel would get upset because they didn't have any fresh water to drink. And Moses would just go to God and God would talk to him. He said, over there in that rock, and he showed him which rock it was. Oh, I tell you what, Moses knew God. He knew God. I would that we were all like Moses. We could go up on top of the mountain and there we could talk with God face to face. Oh, I would that when we come down from the mountain, our faces would glow like his did and people would be afraid of us. And we'd have to put a veil over our face until the majesty, until the glory, until the brilliance of God had dissipated in this old world. But I'm afraid none of us have that very much. I'm afraid sometimes that knowing God is almost a lost, a lost art. Years and years ago, I was in Denver, Colorado at a, at a fellowship meeting of preachers. And as I was there, I, uh, I don't know how I did it, but I got into a group of old preachers. I always like to be the old folks. They know what's going on. They know what the score is. When I was just a kid, I went into the ministry. I was 21 years old when I first started pastoring. And so I was just a kid. And I, I got over there, and I, I don't know beans about nothing. And so I, I got along with these old men, and I just I just slipped right in there, and everything they said was fine with me. And I just rode along with them, and I kept my mouth shut. And I just listened. I didn't open it up because I didn't want to think, know how foolish I was. And so they got over there and they said, well, I think we need to pray for our fellowship. We need to pray for some of these churches because liberalism had started in. Many of the pastors, this was years and years ago, and many of the pastors had gone to some liberal things, and they began to pray for them. And oh, I'll tell you what. Those men got down, and I never heard anything like that in my life. I've never been in where the presence of God was more full than in that bedroom of that motel that, that day. As those old men got on their knees and began to pray, I still didn't say nothing. I just listened. Oh, what a thrill it was to hear and to know the presence of God in the room. Oh, I tell you, sometimes, you know, we've missed a lot, folks. We, we've, got every, we've got everything. We've got automatic dishwashers, and uh, we've, got, uh, we've got everything imaginable. You know, we've got wash machines, and, and we've got all these time-saving <coughs> things, and yet we don't have time to be right with God. We don't have time to have a, an affiliation with God that is so sincere that we endure seeing Him who is invisible. We, don't have a, we haven't worked on that. Oh, we we're making friends with our neighbors, and we make friends with those... Uh, our bosses, and we make friends with those across town, and we try to make friends with the unsaved so we can get them in the house of God and get them saved. But my friend, what about trying to make a friend of God? You see, Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham knew who God was. One day there was three people come walking across the way, and Abraham recognized one of them was God. He recognized him. He went out and said, oh, you guys got to stay. He said, let me kill the fatty calf. Let me, let me have a feast. Honor me in my home. You ought to be begging God today to honor you in your home. You ought to bring the kids out and say, I want you to introduce you uh, to my son. I want to introduce you uh, to my daughter. I want to introduce you to my wife. I want to introduce you to my husband. I want God to be the centerfold in my house. I want him to be in every room. I don't want him locked out of any room. I don't want him locked out of the bedroom. I don't want him locked out of the kids' room. I don't want the rebellion in my house that we find in most houses today. Rebellious wives and rebellious husbands and rebellious kids, they all live in the same house. And my friend, rebellion is no fun. All rebellion ever does is bring heartache and, and destroy. But if my friend, it's because today God's people don't know him. They don't really understand who he is. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 18, if you just take a quick trip over there, let's just look at a verse. I'm, I'm amazed at what God has done. I go in the Old Testament. I, I love to look in the Old Testament. It's, it's, it's so plain and so clear over there in the book of 1 Samuel in chapter 12 and and old uh, Samuel, he, he was talking, and Israel had demanded a king a few chapters back, and, and uh, Samuel tried to tell him it was the wrong thing, and by rejecting uh, God, they wanted a king of the world, it was going to cost them. It says there in chapter 12, and I want you to look at verse number 18, it says, And so Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God that we die not, for we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. Oh, there was repentance that came. It was too late. Everything had already been settled. Everything had already been taken care of. But my friend, God had his way at last. And my friend, in our lives, God can have his way. Even though we have gone our own way, we have done our own thing, we've, we're talking about we've got our lives all planned out. Why don't you just lay on the altar of God tonight and say, Lord, you take care of it. Lord, I want to know who you are. Oh, I know that he's the God that died for me on Calvary's cross. 
Oh, I know he's the God that called me one day and made me know that I was a sinner and showed me that he could forgive me my sin and he could put his robe of righteousness on me and the only righteousness I would have then would be his righteousness, which is sufficient. Amen. I know we know that. But all oh, my friend, do we know what God wants? Do we know who God is in our homes and our children? Would our marriages be better if both of us, husband and wife, could know God better? If we could know what He wants? Am I making sense to you? Have you understood what I'm trying to say? Have you understood what was going through the heart of Nehemiah? You see, Nehemiah broke down. He was in a far country. He was in the palace of a heathen a people. And he was working there. He was laboring. He'd been taken out of the country as a captive. And he, and he asked a friend, he said, What have you heard of the folks left back in Jerusalem? Are my kinfolk still alive? Are things still going on right there? And they told him all things are bad. They're suffering great affliction and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down. And the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept. Oh, what will it take to make the church of God weep? What will it take to make the fundamental Baptist independent church of God weep tonight? You know, we're often so really proud of our independence. And we're so proud of our fundamentalism. We're so proud of our ways that I think sometimes we ought to get on our knees and weep, Lord, forgive me for my pride. Because I believe it hinders our prayers. We're so proud of us that we can't even talk to the other people. We're so proud of us that we can't share the gospel with those that are unsaved. They may be church members of another denomination, but they do not know Jesus. And we approach it with this high-handed attitude. Because you see, in us, we have not condescended. We have not come down to what we really are. Amen. God sees us. And he knows us as we are. I wish today that I knew how to tell you to get to know God. To know him and to know his fullness. I believe Paul talked about it in the New Testament. That's another, another story. I won't get into it tonight. But to know him is something I think you need to take God's word. And you need to get into the Bible. And on your knees in prayer, you need to study the word of God and say, Lord, let me know who you are. Let me know what you want out of me. I don't know what your walk in life is. God does. Lord, you brought me into this situation. What do you want me to do? How can I serve you? How can I serve you? You see, it takes earnestness to have a prayer life. It takes earnestness, but it takes knowledge to know who God is. And then there's something else I think you need to know. I look at verse number 6 of chapter 1. The preacher said I could go to midnight because this was a real spiritual church, right? Uh, he didn't really say that. In chapter 1 in verse number 6. It says, let thine eye, excuse me, let thine ear, sometimes we'd rather have the eye, but let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. Now, we read it a little bit ago, but we looked at the sin part of it. Let's look at a different part of it now. <coughs> Hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray night and day. With a broken heart, weeping, mourning, fasting, he prayed night and day. This is called importunity. It is a vital element in prevailing prayer. Got a dictionary? I looked it up for you. And it says it's an annoyingly persistent. Annoying persistence. That's what importunity is. We can go into the New Testament, and we will hear it a little bit, and get some things out of there where, where the Lord Jesus Christ himself told us we ought to be annoyingly persistent in our prayer life. You see, if we've got something that we know is right, and we've got something that we know it needs to be attended to, then we know God is concerned about it, don't we? And he says keep knocking at the door until somebody answers. Some of us have given up in our prayer life. It was because of the widow's continual coming that she gained her request there in the New Testament. In the book of Luke, and hold your hand in the Nehemiah, we're coming home, we're coming back in a minute. But in the book of Luke, in chapter number 11, we have a story, uh, a quick story tonight. shouldn't take me very long. I read pretty fast. In the book of Luke, in chapter number 11, and verse number 5, And he said unto them, Which of you have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. 
I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, his annoying persistence, a guy keeps knocking at your door, pretty soon he's going to get up, he's going to come downstairs, he may look terrible, his hair may not even be on his head anymore, he may have laid it on the side of the stage. But he's going to come down the stairs, he's going to open that door, he's going to cram those three loaves at you and say, Go! You've got what you wanted. Go! Go feed that hungry neighbor. Go! And it says here, Though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. We find that the storekeeper gave the bread because of the asker's importunity. He continued to be there. He continued to knock on the door. And my friend, let's translate it, get a little bit more spiritual now. And let's go and knock on the door of heaven tonight. Let's knock on the door of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's knock on the throne of God tonight and call upon Him, Lord, save my mother. Do you want her to be saved? Do you think God wants her to be saved? He said He was not willing that any should perish. My friend, but that all should come unto repentance. God wants your mother to be saved. So you knock on the door. Lord, save my mother. Send somebody to her. Touch somebody. Call them up on top of the roof as, as old Peter was or Philip was, you know, and send them down the road. It was Philip on the Ethiopian eunuch. It was Peter, I believe, that went down to the... Uh, the uh, Caesarea, where is that now? Who, who is it? Yeah. What's the guy's name? Remember? Cornelius. That's what I'm talking about. It started with the C. He was, he was, I think it was Peter who was sent down to Cornelius. But my friend, those men were listening, weren't they? And you know, I believe that God has men that are listening to him right now, today. And no matter where your parents may live, where your mother may live, where your dad may live, where your sons or your daughters may live, you see, you may not be able to talk to them anymore, but God can. God can. And so you get on the telephone line to heaven. And because of your importunity, you bring them up again and again and again. We've got some folks in our church, every time we have prayer requests, they'll stand up and say, pray for my kids. I know what they're talking about. The kids are not serving Jesus. And oh, how mom and dad wish they would. And they have a broken heart. My friend, they keep praying. And one day, I believe we'll see those kids get right with God. If the Lord tarries his coming, we're going to see those kids get right with God. It was while Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. Old Joshua was down there fighting the battle with everything he had to fight with, and he was a good fighter, my friend. He had the children of God, and they were good fighters. But every time that Moses would drop his hands, he'd get tired, he'd get weary, and he couldn't hold his hands up anymore, and the battle would go against him. You know, some wise people in the church, some wise people, the children of Israel, they saw what was happening. And they went up over there, and they got a big old rock. And they got it over where Moses was. He could lean against it. That was marvelous. He could hold his hands up a little longer now. But they saw that wasn't enough. First thing you know, one of them got over here and said, Brother Moses, let me hold this arm. And they held that arm out there, put it on his shoulder. And the other guy said, let me hold that arm, Moses. And they held that arm, and Moses sat on the rock, and he held his arms, and he prayed, and oh, my friend, the battle was won. Amen. Well, that's what it takes today. It takes the children of God to get together. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst, he said. And my friend, I want you to know it's not just any God. It's just not any power, but it is the God. It is the power of the universe, my friend. He is the one who created all. And that is in it everything that is there. Amen. He has all power in heaven and earth. Right. And I'll tell you something else. And he loves you. Amen. And he loves you. Get to know him. I'll tell you what. I, when I was a young fellow, and somebody told me a girl loved me, I wanted to get to know her. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Well, I found out Laverne likes me, I wanted to get to know her. Well, I got to know her so well, I married her. And I even know her better now. But she knows me. In the dark of the night, when things aren't right, she knows that she senses and she starts praying for me. Before I walk up to preach most every time, she'll reach over and whisper at me. She said, honey, I'm praying. And you see, in myself, I'm nothing. In yourself, you're nothing. But it's God that we present to you today. Amen. It's prayer, and that is talking with God that we present to you today. Verse Thessalonians 5, 17 said, and you sing it tonight again and again, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. I'm going to turn one more verse in Galatians chapter 6. I'm not going to give you the whole load tonight. We've got about four more points of this message, but 
But we'll just we'll hold it off here. In Galatians in chapter six tonight. Galatians and comes the book of Ephesians. In Galatians chapter six, I believe this is very, very important today. It says in verse seven, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth that you also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And that's what I'm talking about tonight. Let's sow some spiritual seed. Let's get on our knees tonight and say, Lord, show me how I can know you better. Lord, get a hold of my heart. Transform me. You see, back in the book of Romans, in chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good, perfect, acceptable will of God. Oh, I tell you what, Christians today, you get on your knees tonight and say, Lord, do something for me. Lord, I want to sow some spiritual seed tonight. And it says here, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. My friend, most of us are just existing as Christians. We're not living in the life more abundant, more and more and more abundant as we ought to be. We're just existing. We're just getting by. We're splitting our time between the world and the church. We're trying to be friends with the devil and with Jesus. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we fight not. Be not weary in well-doing. For ye shall reap if you faint not. My friend, it's better to be on praying terms with God than to go to work and have a paycheck. Yeah. God can take care of the paycheck. But my friend, who's going to take care of you getting on your knees and praying? Is God going to make you pray? I don't think so. You're going to have to have a desire to know Him. When in need, no, not just when in need. My friend, there's been a need since day one, when God looked down and he saw that the ways of men were sick. And he said, your son will die on Calvary's bones. There are people you've never met in Coquille. There are people you don't know anything about here in Coquille. And they're lost without Jesus. And they think the churches are filled with hypocrites. And the reason they think churches are filled with hypocrites is because most Christians in churches today don't know God. Oh, I believe many of them are saved. You can be saved without really knowing him. I got married without really knowing my wife. I thought she was rich. <laughs> she told me after she thought I was rich. <laughs> I guess we deserved each other, huh? <laughs> Neither one of us are rich. Never have been, probably never will be, except in the blessings of heaven. Amen. And we're rich in his blessings. And I found today, you know what we strive for? To be happy. Not what makes men happy. It's not a good paycheck. It's not a nice home. It's not even good health, folks. You know what's worth striving for? You know what makes a successful man today? It's peace with God. Peace with God. How can you have that peace except that you know Him? Well, I've got to quit someplace. I might as well do it here. Be not weary and well doing. Ye shall reap if you faint not. Amen. I wonder today, have you started? Have you started to the cross? I wonder today, have you went to the cross, you got saved, and you left the cross? Then you need to go back to the cross. You need to go back to the foot of the cross. <coughs> Christian, you never need to move away from the foot of the cross. You need to go back there and get on your knees and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. And after you confessed every sin that you know of, then you need to say, Lord, thou who knowest me more than I myself, would you reveal to me what I've left out? You'll be amazed. You plan to spend a little time. And when you get all that done, I think you'll begin to know who the Lord is. And let me tell you something wonderful. He doesn't want to condemn you. He said if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And right there on your knees at the altar of God, as we confess our sin, He washes us and He'll make us pure. And our hearts will get lighter as we begin to all do you know who he is today? Would you stand with me for a word of prayer? <coughs> My Heavenly Father, we've come to this part of the service, and Lord, we're thankful. We're thankful for your grace and for your tender love. Lord, we're thankful for your word. And Lord, I pray tonight as we have tried to bring some things here about Nehemiah and his desire and prayer. 
Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Surely, Lord, as we gather here tonight, we would realize our filthiness in this life. We realize the fact that, Lord, even the very best of us are still sinners. But praise God, most of us are saved by the grace of God. Saved by the blood of Jesus. But, Lord, even so, we're not content to dwell in the sin that's in our lives. Lord, we're not content to have only a half-life with you. Lord, tonight, I believe that there are some of us that want to come and want to know you better. Lord, there are some of us tonight that want to come. And they want to ask you to make a difference in their lives and to show them some things they've never known before. They want to get acquainted with you. And Lord, they might pattern their life after you in every fashion. Lord, may thy will be done tonight. Even as we give this invitation, may folks respond but with an open heart and with a willing mind. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor, I don't know how you do it, so you just take charge. God's will be done.
I'm glad that the devil didn't get in there and tell me anything else was more important. Truth is, if I wasn't here tonight, I'd probably be sitting on the couch at home. Of course, the visitation team may be out, but they don't know this, but when I send them out visiting, and I go home and watch TV. And I'm sure <laughs> But I'd rather be here than any other place tonight. Amen. You know, if you don't come tomorrow night, you're going to miss the same kind of blessing and hearing the Word of God. And encourage everyone of you to be out here tomorrow night. Don't let Pastor Metz or his wife get away from here without letting them know how much you appreciated the message tonight. Encourage them. Let them know you're praying for them tomorrow night and then go home and do it. Let's pray for a blessing. Pray that every one of us. We want this to be a praying church, don't we? Amen. We don't want our gates to be tumbling down. We don't want the devil getting into this place. We want to continue winning souls and seeing people baptized and discipled. Marriages put back together and kids raised up knowing Jesus Christ. Many of us have been living up there in the world and we know what it's like and the mistakes that we have to look back on. But we can get kids raised up in church and they won't have to look back on those mistakes that we did. Amen. Let's be here tomorrow night, okay? Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of your word and hearing it tonight. Lord, I pray that you would help every one of us to have a desire to get to know you better. Lord, I know you desire to know us. And Father, I pray we have the same desire for you. Lord, I do pray that we would lay aside those things that we tend to think are more important than prayer, and we would devote that time that we think is more important to you and showing you how much we love you, that we might be more prayerful that, Lord, we might truly pray for one another as a church. And Father, above all, just give our praises unto you for your salvation you've given to us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.